Warning, the following video contains instances of extreme violence. Viewer discretion is advised. Hi guys, and many thanks for joining me. If you're new to my channel, hi, I'm Kat, and I like to talk about crime, investigations, missing people, conspiracy theories, and everything related. Please don't forget to hit the subscribe button below and also hit the notification bell so you are the first one to know about any new videos I upload. And for my returning subscribers, I would like to thank you so, so much for all the support you're showing me and for all those lovely comments. Thank you. Before we get started, here is the disclaimer. I do not mean to be disrespectful to anyone I talk about in this video. The video is for entertainment and educational purposes only. The information I collect is from the internet. I compile this information together and make a video. And from the video, you guys are more than welcome to draw your own conclusions. Thank you. Before I get started, I would like to give my special thanks to Carolyn Waite for the special invitation and the warm welcome she gave me on her Facebook group, Madeline McCann and others chat group so guys please please take the time and join Carolyn's group on Facebook she is amazing and the members of her group are really awesome I'm on there as well so if you join we can definitely have a chat and uh, please please do please do so I'm gonna leave the link in the description below and also in light of recent events I want to give my thanks for the support shown in dealing with the situation to Antoinette Gordon, who is the owner of the Facebook group Madeline McCann, what lies behind the truth. I'm in this group as well, so please, please join. Antoinette is brilliant and her group has tons of useful stuff. Again, I'm going to leave the description, uh, the link in the description below. So I've been, uh, again, I've been looking on the internet uh, to see if uh, there's any more of Amaral's books for sale online in the UK. And I actually found a place where I found uh, a few of the books, but unfortunately I couldn't find any book which is um, in English. So uh, what I could find was um, a Portuguese version of the book. I think it was also a Danish version of the book and uh, an Italian one. So uh, guys, if you are interested to buy them, uh, I'm leaving the links in the description below. And also, I think that um, there is a used book for sale on eBay UK. And um, yeah, I, I don't think I've... Yes, you can find the PDF versions as well on eBay. But uh, you know, I honestly, I do prefer to have the paperback. So actually a book to hold in my hand too much technology nowadays. Today I want to talk to you about the Smith man or the Smith sighting, whichever way you want to name it, still the same thing. Whilst I did make up my mind who the Smith man is and I will reveal to you a bit later on in the video who I think it is, please do let me know in the comments below if you really do believe that the Smith sighting is real or fake. Okay, so I just want to start with a bit of an introduction into the Smith sighting. The Smiths from Ireland are spending their holiday in Praia da Luz. After dinner at the Dolphin restaurant, they head over to Kelly's bar, which is just 50 meters away from the restaurant. They leave the bar at around 9.55 in the evening and head over to their apartment in Estrella da Luz, which is west of the Ocean Club. The Smith family is a big family, four adults and five children. And long story short, let's just keep it short, the group spreads out with the children never too far away from the adults. The streets are empty. They climb some steps to reach 25 de Abril Street. They cross it and turn left into Juan de Mayo Street, which runs to the west side of the Ocean Club. After no more than 30 meters, they see a man walking in the middle of the street, holding a child in his arms with the head resting on his left shoulder. Remember, as I mentioned in my previous video, Jane Turner sighting, as I said, it would have been impossible for someone to carry a child across the arms, as Jane said. And no, I don't believe for a second Jane sightings was real. Even if Dr. Todman came forward a long while later after uh, the alleged abduction, he was carrying his child in the opposite direction of Jane Tanner's alleged abductor and they also knew each other from tennis so I think that uh, he probably assumed Jane's sighting was in fact her seeing him carrying his child to his apartment and then we also have the, uh, David Payne's statement where he has 
quite some slips of tongues and he refers to she as Jane as carrying the child since the police officer asked about she, Jane. Not only that, but he also says in his statement my recollection was more about the description of the pyjamas not fitting in with the description of the newspaper and if I was to say that she was carrying the child, you know, like this and then he goes on and on and on and then he also apologizes for saying that she was carrying the child and now he says if you were carrying the child so what do we understand from this? What I understand is that a liar has slips of tongue and without even realizing he spills the truth because a lie is much harder to control and keep it consistent. consistent. Whereas if you tell the truth then you don't need to control yourself. You know it just comes out. Words just come out of your mouth. You speak the truth. Nothing wrong about that. And then he's also saying the description of the pyjamas doesn't fit with the newspaper. I mean, is it, is it really a joke? Why even say that? Clearly, if it would be the truth, then the description of the pyjamas wouldn't change at all, would it? It doesn't need to fit, it just needs to be true and real. But now, let's get back to the Smiths, okay? The way that this man is holding the child it is much more plausible than the Tannerman. The girl's head is resting on his shoulder, her arms are hanging by her side and she's wearing pale colored pyjamas, bare feet with blonde hair that covers her neck. The man is wearing cream colored or beach trousers. He's around 30 to 35 years old and between 170 meters to 180 meters tall. His brown hair cut short and face tanned. So, okay. The Smiths in the end they return to Ireland. After their return there they follow the case and they find out that according to Jane's statements Murat is the man seen on the night of the abduction. Mr. Smith contacts the Irish police and insists the man they saw carrying a child was not Murat because Mr. Smith knew Murat. Amaral and his team at this point they secretly organized for the Smiths to return to Portugal and on 26th of May 2007 they interviewed the father and the son in the offices of the Department of Criminal Investigation in Portimao. Both say because of the light conditions at uh, night they wouldn't be able to recognize the man carrying the child but they do describe clearly the way this man was holding the child and how he was walking. They then go back to the scene with the investigators where they point the precise place where they came across the man. The Smith statements and their Portugal visit remain secret and in a few days they return to Ireland and contact is being maintained. After more than four months in the Algarve, the McCanns return to England where they are greeted in such a way like the liberation of hostages held for years in a far off countries. Welcome back King and Queen. And of course the BBC and so many other news channels are broadcasting the news of their arrival. In Ireland, the Smiths are watching the news showing the same event. They instantly recognized the man they saw on the night of Maddie's disappearance. Mr. Smith, after seeing the other news channels, is certain the man they saw was Jerry McCann by the way he's holding the child and the way he's walking. He contacts the police and waits to be called back. Amaral and the team find out at the end of September and they start to understand why Jane Tanner sent the alleged abductor in the opposite direction to that taken by the man seen by the Smith family. She had to divert suspicion away from Jerry who, if guilty, would have taken this route. So that's why, in my opinion, I think she came up with the abductor story. With the agreement of the uh, National Director of the Judiciary Police, Amaral is trying to get the Smiths back to Portugal for an identification of Jerry. Everything is set in motion, all details sorted and now all that's left is to choose the hotel they'll be staying at. And I like to add here a quote for, from Amaral's book. But the Smiths were never to come back to Portugal. After my departure, the PJ were to change their minds. 
they asked the Irish police to proceed with interviewing the witness. That decision was to seriously delay the process since the Smiths were not interviewed until several months later. Meanwhile, rumors were to circulate and people not involved with the, in, with the investigation would be made aware of the existence of this witness. Someone allegedly even sought out contact with the family without it being known to what end. Honestly, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it was the McCann's circle doing this. Maybe the idea was to silence them? I don't know, but something weird happened, didn't it? I mean, it's, uh, it's quite known in my opinion that, uh, you know, they are trying to sort of keep uh, those people who are against them quiet. That then would make the Smith sighting real, right? That then would mean that one of the group's member would be the man seen by Mr. Smith. But let's think about it this way, okay? Jane goes to check on the kids at 9.15. She spots a man carrying a child. The alarm is raised at around 10 p.m. or so, right? And at around the same time, the Smiths see a man carrying a child. Logically, if we are to believe Jane's sighting, then the same man is spotted by the Smith family. That man, at that time and at that location, could be doing only one of three things, in my opinion. Abduct a sleeping child, carry a deceased body, or innocently going home with his sleeping child. And that's what the Smith family believed initially, that the man was going home with his sleeping child. In the case of abduction and carrying a deceased body, as logic dictates, the person wouldn't want to be seen, right? If this cannot be avoided by any means, then the person would try to behave as naturally as possible as to not raise suspicion. The instinct here would be to avoid other people seeing you, right? On the other hand, however, if we talk about a man carrying his own child, then he couldn't care less who sees him. But, but, let's go back to the Smith family. We know there are nine people, okay? Nine people heading to their apartment after a night out around 10 in the evening. Narrow street, dark and silent. Now, can you imagine a group of people being so silent that the man trying to hide something or avoid being seen cannot hear them? I really think not. No, he's trying to... So imagine this, the abductor, yeah? Let's say the abductor. He's trying to get the hell out of there. His adrenaline kicks in. He's probably even sweating, having breathing, whatever. His senses are heightened. So I have to ask the question. Why didn't he use an alternative route? It's clear he heard all these people. He knew where he's heading just as he knew he could have avoided the encounter. What I want to point here is this man on this night, on this street, he wants to be seen. No doubt in my mind, he wants to be seen. You know that child is uh, wearing light colored pajamas, barefoot, similar to the child which was just abducted, not even half a mile away. So this makes me realize that the sighting was provoked and it was planned all along. And this was definitely not by chance. The Smith says the man looks like Jerry uh, at some point later on, as I mentioned above. So I need to know. Why was Jerry walking around Praia da Luz wanting to be seen carrying a child dressed like Madeline in his arms on the night of uh, the alleged abduction around the same time that Kate sounds the alarm? And he's not seen only once, he's seen three times. The Smiths are scattered in around three groups as per their PJ statements. And funny enough, this man is seen by all three groups and he even passes by them. If you still think that the man was caught off guard by the Smiths, I think you are completely wrong. The three groups, they don't all walk at the same pace, do they? I mean, you have a four-year-old who is slower than the adults, then you have another person feeling ill, then you also have the steps. So I'm quite sure they are scattered, some in front of the others. This man has plenty of opportunities to actually change his route, to avoid being seen. The family is walking slowly uphill in his direction 
and he's walking downhill towards them, right? I'm asking, why is he not changing direction, but he goes head on towards them? He's first passing by Smith's son, the second time by Smith's father, and then he reaches the corner, right? At this point, he can already hear the noise from the last group who are on the stairs or the steps, okay? So, let's say for a moment that he is the abductor. Again, I'm going by logic here. Even though these people won't find out exactly then what happened, maybe only a few days later, let's say, as an abductor, you would still try to avoid too many witnesses, right? Is enough you've already been seen by two groups, so you should just turn right as to avoid being seen by the rest. But what is this man doing? <laughs> oh my God, oh my God. He goes straight towards the stairs where he already knows there are more witnesses. And this tells me he doesn't only want to be seen, but also to be seen heading towards the sea, towards the beach. Let me clarify this. I don't think he knew he will meet the Smiths. No, no, no. I think that this actually happened by chance. But when he left, from where he left, his intention was to, see, to be seen carrying someone who looks just like Madeline, heading in the direction of the beach. You might be asking why this route? He had to go to the only area where he would be sure he's seen by people, where there is some sort of movement at that time in the night, and that is Kelly's Bar. And I'm pretty sure if he wouldn't encounter the Smiths, he would just go in the direction of Kelly's bar, waiting for some movement and making himself seen. And things went exactly how he planned, exactly. So I got to the point where, yes, I do believe that Jerry McCann is the Smith man, but I don't believe he carried the deceased body of Maddie when the Smiths saw him. Yes, I do believe he carried Maddie's body, but that was over a shorter distance and not now when he was spotted by the Smiths. There are also people saying that how could he possibly carry a, a sedated child as he could be recognized? But I need to ask, recognized by who exactly? I mean, most of their time on holiday, they spent it at Ocean Club, the Tennis Club, the Tapas, and their apartments. They, yeah, they've been once to the beach, yeah, they went jogging and so on. So, in my opinion, there's very little chance that anyone in Praia da Luz knew them before Maddie's disappearance. What I think is, Kate prematurely sounded the alarm. I think that it was done too quickly. And it seems that Jerry was really angry that night. Kate was also angry, punching the walls, leaving bruises on herself the next day. But what parent gets angry on the night of their daughter's disappearance? Seriously, I mean, yes, you are upset. Okay, I get it. Panicked, most definitely. Scared, yes, of course. But anger, that comes much later. Now there's the question of the child being carried. Is the child asleep, sedated, dead? I can definitely say this child was not asleep. Why? Why, you ask me, maybe. If you look at this, taken, I think, on the 4th of May, you can see outside is not hot. They are wearing jackets, so it is a chill, cold night. Now, imagine a child in pajamas barefoot, with no jacket, no blanket, being carried at least 400 meters in the cold. Wouldn't that child wake up? I mean, yes, don't get me wrong. I know that children are usually warmer in general, at least that's the case with me and my children. But when we sleep, our body temperature goes down. That's why we usually need covers to sleep. That's why when we are cold, we wake up. And it's impossible for this child to be sleeping and not wake up. And if we are to believe it was the abductor with Madeline, 
she would wake up from the cold and do you think she would be so silent finding herself in the arms of a stranger really i mean that's quite impossible uh, it is it is impossible it's impossible let's get to the other option now which would be the dead child the smiths see the man carrying the child the child's head is resting on the man's shoulder if the child would be dead the man wouldn't be able to carry the body in that position why look at this and then i'll explain it in my next point i'm sorry for the photo i hope it's not triggering anything i'm just trying to prove a point here you see the mom is holding the baby which passed away and pay attention to the baby's head see how it's tilted backwards because there's no muscle there which works there's nothing to hold the head in the upright position we know that the smith that the smith said uh, the abductor was not supporting the child's head with his hand and now i want to ask you this you do know why a newborn's head has to be supported right because their muscles are too weak to hold the head which brings me to the sedation part we already covered the child couldn't have been sleeping it was too cold they would wake up yeah the difference between the dead body of a child in terms of muscles and the child being sedated is that the sedated child still has control of their muscles yes they are sedated but the blood is still flowing the muscles are still working you know when you fall asleep without realizing and you drop your head and by instinct you get it back up you are still asleep but it's your brain who is signaling hey your head back up although sedated the child can still control their reactions the smith said the man carrying the child did not support the head comparing to the deceased child however where the blood is not flowing that's it there's no support for the head there's no brain activity the muscles are stiff the head falls backwards a man couldn't possibly carry a deceased child for at least 400 meters without someone realizing something is wrong because i'm really sorry and i really do hate saying this but a dead child doesn't look the same as a sedated or sleeping child i'm trying to be sensitive but i also need to be realistic and i'm really really sorry again i also wanted to add a photo of such child being carried to show you an example example but i couldn't get myself to do it so sorry and i really don't want to get into more details you know about gravitation physics medicine and so on i mean i think you get the idea anyway but you might be asking yourself why do i say the 400 meters distance if you would believe jane tanner's sighting was real and it was medicine by the smiths then the distance would be 700 meters the route taken to east past murat's house and then turning back west where the sighting happened if you believe like i do that maddie was not the child being carried then the distance becomes 400 meters because the man turns west immediately after leaving apartment 5a so my conclusion is the child carried by jerry mccann where the smith sighting happened was sedated and alive which means that jerry was not carrying madeline in the smith sightings jerry was carrying another child so we know the man is seen heading towards the beach right and one would assume he's going there to hide the body i'll tell you something else which makes me believe jerry didn't at that point head to the beach carrying a body to hide it he wanted to be seen carrying a body heading towards the beach again as a diversion tactic it's not the first time is it so we are quite used to them trying all sorts of diversion tactics so it's nothing new here but why do i believe that well please do have a look at this photo this is the road leading to the beach two important things one you can see the lamppost which means even if he would go at 10 pm when dark that that tiny area there is still visible there's still a bit of light and there would be people sleeping or i don't know doing whatever in their houses so he can't really risk carrying and burying a body at the beach to uh, a second thing 
the dog sign please notice the dog sign which means they are dogs walking about in the area and we know how dogs are they dig holes in the sand and so on so again not a good place to hide the body unless uh, you know you want the dog to to smell the um, yes then then the most important we also have kids going to the beach and what do kids do at the beach in the sand they build sand castle they build sand castles they dig holes they play in the sand by the next morning after maddie's disappearance not everybody knew a child had disappeared so naturally kids would be at the beach right no one would think hiding a body in the sand is such a good idea the police also scoured the whole area with dogs and they couldn't find anything apart from some black bean bags and you can't say that a man like jerry mccann going on holiday in a place he's never been before will know the beach better than the local police no that's impossible yes he did go to the beach i know but that's not enough time to scan the whole area to find a hiding spot yes i know there are sewer pipes but they are quite hidden and uh, if you're not a local it's quite difficult to spot it and even if you do the body would definitely be found because the locals they know the place which means kids of the locals know the place and don't tell me there would be no kids playing in those sewer pipes because i wouldn't believe you no you know that's such a great place for a kid to actually hide his treasure chest or you know play hide and seek and there there are kids who actually play uh, treasure treasure hunting and you know hiding their treasures like little toy that they fancy and uh, their favorite toys and so on and now i'm gonna show you f some photos of how we could get to this uh, sewer on the beach the sewer is located 30 to 40 meters from nearby houses which clearly proves it is well known to local residents there are also no crevices on the beach where a body could be hidden okay so let's say that the smith sighting took place at around 10 pm right but let's benefit with the man carrying the child and say it was at about 9 50 pm let's say that from there to the sewer area it took about 10 15 minutes it was dark and presumably jerry's been down there only once before so that makes it around 10 pm 10 05 pm this is how the access would look like please have a look here it's a day and a, a night comparison you can't tell me with these photos that a person who doesn't know the area would be able to find this sewer in these light conditions no then his mobile phone rings kate gave the alarm walking back to the resort would take around 20 minutes then then there's also the sand if jerry would have been carrying maddie's body to the beach he would definitely have some traces of sand not some but quite a lot i mean you you know like when you take your kids to the playground you guys play in the sand and when you get home the sand is everywhere you just can't get rid of it oh that's so annoying actually and then after the alarm is raised we already all know what happened the if it made after the smith's characteristics does show similarities to jerry mccann actually mr smith is 60 to 80 percent certain it was jerry he saw so in those light conditions in the night i would say that the accuracy is acceptable as it seems as it seems findings by former mi5 agents long kept under wraps by the mccanns included two ifits and these images are of the suspected kidnapper which the smith saw that night which we know is allegedly jerry mccann find madeline fund silenced henry exton an ex mi5 undercover operation chief and his team with a lawyer's letter which would bind them to the confidentiality of a report they compiled which contained controversial information 
The report was eventually delivered in November 2008, and this, although gave very little credibility to Jane Tanner's sighting, it focused more on the Smith sighting. These images were not even published in Kate's book from 2011, although the book has eight key sightings with their corresponding effects, but the Smith sighting is not there. I'm not surprised if it's something which can incriminate them, is nowhere to be found, is it? It's always disregarded, disposed of, hidden, and so on. This report is said to question parts of the McCann's evidence, contains sensitive information about Madeline's sleeping patterns, and raises the highly sensitive possibility that she could have died in an accident after leaving the apartment herself from one of the two unsecured doors. Okay, moving on, moving on to my next point. Let's not for a second get confused here. In my opinion, Jerry did dispose of Maddie's body, but not when he was seen by the Smiths. I believe that the child Jerry was carrying was actually Ella O'Brien, who is strikingly similar to Madeline. For the abducted story to make sense, there had to be a flow between Jane's sighting and the Smith sighting. That was making sure the alleged abductor is seen by someone carrying a child towards the beach. What would that tell you if you would not have uh, more information apart from a child being abducted? Let's say you are new to this, you see a man carrying a child, you, you know, you learn that uh, the child was abducted and that man is heading toward the beach. So, what would you think the man would be doing heading towards the beach with the child? that the man carrying the child is heading to the beach either to dispose of the body or take a boat and leave the area. The first option to me is much more plausible than the second. The Smiths were not uh, tactically selected, but it was beneficial to Jerry and the plan and he went with it. It was even better for Jerry actually because he didn't have to wonder about making sure that he's being seen. So, quite honestly, uh, to Jerry, the, the Smiths being where, where they were at that time, it was a blessing. For him, it was. The only thing that uh, I can't uh, really have an opinion about, or rather no idea about, is uh, where Maddie's body would be. Where would Jerry hide her? I mean, it had to be somewhere he was familiar with, right? But also somewhere quite remote. But, but somewhere where he would know that no one would look. It also had to be somewhere closer to 5A, but again, maybe a private property that we don't know about. I don't know, I have no idea. I'm thinking it could very well be somewhere inside, but, but really I just can't figure it out. I do believe, however, that when the McCanns and the group came up with this cover-up, they had no idea it will amount to such a phenomenal international response. And they probably had no idea that more than 10 years later, it would still be this huge. The problem is, now that they are in the public eye, they really can't stop carrying on with the farce. They can't stop it because if they do, and if they would, then they would be seen as behaving suspiciously. And again, they all they want to do is take suspicion away from them. So, I mean, I don't know, I guess, whether they like it or not, they'll have to carry on if, uh, you know, they don't want to look suspicious. But it does have its perks, I think, doesn't it? I mean, you get money, you get fame, you get recognition, and so on. So, it's quite beneficial as well for them. And that's all for today's video. Make sure that you subscribe and you hit the notification bell, because my next video will be about Clarence Mitchell. And uh, please don't forget to join the Facebook groups I mentioned at the beginning of the video. It would be really, really helpful. Thank you. Also, if you are, if you are interested to buy the paperback uh, book of Gonzalo Amaral's, again, check the links in the description below. Thank you so much, guys, for watching today. Take care and stay safe. Bye-bye.